Good morning, everybody. Welcome to St. Elizabeth of Calgary Scripture Study Class here in Port Natchez, Texas. Uh, this Sunday is the 18th Sunday in Ordinary Time, and I wanted to remind you that we have a Scripture Class every Sunday here. It begins after the 9 a.m. Mass at St. Elizabeth. Uh, it ends about 15 minutes before the 11 o'clock Mass, so it's right in between the two Masses. So come and join us here at Hebert Hall. If we're not in Hebrew Hall, we'll be in building, I mean, room three in Hebrew Hall. So let us start off with the prayers always. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, let us understand that nothing matters but you. Save us from ourselves and our weaknesses. Let us live for you and love you with all our hearts, souls, and bodies. For all in this earthly world is indeed vanity, unless the goal is to live eternally with you. Grant us your mercy and forgive us our trespasses against you. We strive to do as you please, but see through a foggy mirror. Let us see ourselves as you see us and give us the strength and will to take up our cross and follow you. We ask this in our, I say, Creator, Lord and Savior. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> All right, right off the bat, I have a little trivial thing that I just wanted to mention to me personally, and this doesn't have to do with the scripture, basically, but I grew up basically with idols, you know, and I had people that I, were people that I looked up to in life. Of course, the first one, even since I was, grew up Catholic from uh, early back in Our Lady Guadalupe in Port Arthur, but my first idol was always Jesus, you know, you had to, that was just, you know, to me. Then after that was St. Francis was my idol because I loved his story and I must have seen something when I was younger about him. And then another one was Mahatma Gandhi because of what he did and how he was a peaceful man and, and he went around you know, fighting for the poor, the people that he, he fought for. And, and he was, uh, I just looked up to him and there probably was another movie I would watch. And then it starts progressing more and more down as you from Jesus. <laughs> But it's James Dean, you know, I don't read people, Jean, James Dean, but in actuality, if James Dean was before my time, I say, I say that, I just pay attention, but Michael Parks, if you know Michael Parks, he, there was a movie called Then Came Bronson, we rode around the country in a motorcycle, and that was me, you know, and so his idol was James Dean, so I, of course, I, I couldn't. Anyway, I, I say all that to ask you this question here. These questions, which of the one of the following above said the following? First one is, who said of these five, who said hate the sinner, I mean hate the sin, love the sinner? Which one? I, I didn't hear you. St. Francis. Oh, St. Francis, St. Francis. Anybody else? Okay, I'm going to tell you afterwards okay how about the second one whatever you do will be insignificant but it's very important that you do it you could probably tell me who it wasn't <laughs> Gandhi he said okay and the third one the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others Jesus. Jesus, right? Okay, I'm going to tell you that Mahatma Gandhi said all of these. He said all three of these. And none of the others did. Especially the first one, people think it comes from Bible, the scripture. Hate the sin, love the sinner, but it doesn't. Just a trivia. Anyway, these the three readings that we have this Sunday, okay, are really kind into each other, but usually it's the first and the last um, gospel, but I think that the second uh, reading also ties in to whole because you have to look at it in a more um, general way. It, they, it all tied in, of course, all scripture does, really. But anyway, in the first reading, the words of David's son, Kohelith, and I, I guess that's a good way to say it, Kohe, Kohelith, king in Jerusalem declares all is vanity. Nothing matters at all except what matters to God. And I, I, you'll see how this kind of plays out, and it's really kind of, uh, to me, it's kind of even depressing, you know, a little bit. 
Anyway, the second reading is about St. Paul states that all that really matters is living and dying for and with Jesus so we may be raised with him. And so that's what Paul was em emphasizing to the Colossi Colossians uh, in our second reading. And in the gospel, Jesus states that God's kingdom is not of this world, but of the next. All material things are blessings from God to sustain us. All the good that God has given us is for a reason, a good reason. All excess should be for the glory of God and not to be abused. And that's generally what happens. We abuse the blessings that we get from God. And we justify it in some sense or some word. So the first reading, a reading from the book of Ecclesiastes, I guess, and you can see I have to write it there. Ecclesiastes. I've always had trouble with that name, and I'll continue well today. To understand the first reading, okay, and this is what I'm saying, because to me, if you take about what the reading says, you'll almost, it's kind of depressing, really. But you have to look at it in the terms of the Bible as a, as a O, you know, I mean, as a whole, is that the Old Testament is in the New. The Old Testament is revealed in the New. As the great theologian St. Augustine once said holy, about Holy Scripture, in the Old Testament, the New is concealed. In the New Testament, the Old is revealed. And that is very much true, okay? And as you, if you can think about it, because when you hear about or know what you know about the Old Testament versus the New Testament, you can see there's a quite a difference, even in the writing style and the way that God is portrayed. You know, the Holy Spirit works in a different way. And of course, there is no Jesus, right? It compares, so there's a big differences. And you have to look at the Bible in a general sense or, or that both of them are part of each other. You know, and you have to look at it in part also of God's plan. Because, you know, he didn't start off right from the very beginning, and there Jesus is here. Many thousands and thousands of years have passed in God's plan. That's why we had started off with the law of nature, you know, where people didn't have any really rules like the commandments, because that was to come, right? You had the law of nature that Jesus created, I mean, God created us, our creators, to know right from wrong, left from right, up and down. You know, he put it in, in us to know if we were happy or if we were sad, right? And so that was the law of nature. And we were born with that understanding. We call it today our conscience, you know, a conscience. And then, of course, it grew into the law of Moses because we, that God put for us forth laws and rules that we needed to have to help us to understand. And then still, even that wasn't enough, you know. It just, but as you can see, this, this is a progression until a law of, law of love, Jesus came and, turned and completed it. He came to fulfill the law, and he came. But as you can see, that what we're talking about in the first, first reading, we're talking about this mentality. So you have to understand how God was portrayed or how he was thought or how he revealed himself. And as you know, through time, God has revealed himself more and more through time because at the first, you didn't see the Holy Spirit, you know, I mean, working in people, except for special people that it selected, of course. And then God was only all talking to like a Moses and certain people also. And then, and they talked for God, you know, and then, of course, Jesus came and was the totality of it. But even so, what did Jesus say when he was here and he was going to be leaving? I will send who? The Holy Spirit, right? And it wasn't until then, until Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit became, what I would say, available to all of us, not to just some, to all of us. So all that made a difference. But you can see here, and when we talk about the common mistaken beliefs in the Old Testament, and because we get this from people or different interpretations of the Old Testament, but a lot of people think that God is angry. That God in the Old Testament, he's angry. He kills people, you know, just because if you're not 
following him, whatever, and he, but he's, he's angry and he's a punisher, okay? You remember what also came from the Old Testament to thinking that if someone is blind or disabled, it's because of their sin or their parents' sin or somebody's sin. So it's punishment that they had and they were born with, okay? And we know that's not true, right? And also, it was, like I said, it was a different time in God's plan, and we're talking about the, old, uh, uh, the first reading. Uh, the Holy Spirit fell upon the prophets, kings, and messiahs only, and no one went to heaven after death. You know, so there wasn't this thing about the resurrection of the dead and people living to, for the next world and stuff like that. It's in this progression that the people were living. They were kind of like looking up to and relied on the prophets and the leaders and the kings to lead them to, and to spread the word. Uh, and those who died were in dormant sleep called basically limbo. And can you think of it, any others? What, when you think of the Old Testament, what do you think is different than today? Anything? All right, let's move on. The book of Ecclesiastes, whatever, the, the Hebrew name of this book and its author, Kehoelit, is actually a title and it perhaps means assembler of students or listeners or collector of wisdom sayings. The book more common name, Ecclesiastes, is an approximate translation into Greek of this word. Uh, the issues with which the author deals and the question he raises are aimed at those who would claim any absolute values in this life, okay, including possessions, fame, success, or pleasure. Wisdom itself is challenged, but foolishness is condemned. So it's a matter of someone here and this person here uh, Kohelith, I call, call him, is put into the fact of looking at life here on this earth and what is it for, you know? What is it for? But, uh, the refrain which begins and ends the book of, vanity, of vanities recurs at key points throughout, throughout the Hebrew word hebo, vanity, has the sense of emptiness, futility, absurd you know, so like, for what, you know? And you hear this throughout. And it, like I said, it, it, it was kind of that way, and you could understand how they thought that way, especially here, okay? And I'm going to skip through some of these because I can tell you i got 50 slides, and we ain't going to get through all of them. <laughs> Many would locate Ecclesiastes in the 3rd century B.C. when Judea was under the oppression dom domination of Hellenistic kings from Egypt. And this is the key important, especially in this writing. These kings were highly efficient in their ruthless exploitation of the land and the people. The average Jew we're talking about here would have felt a sense of powerlessness and inability to change things for the better. You know, they almost didn't have hope, you know. For Kohelet, God seems remote uncommunicative, and we cannot hope to understand, much less influence, God's activity in the world. So it's, it's almost like God was at a distance to them, you know, because he didn't, it wasn't like it is today. We can pray, get on our knees, and the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and we feel this God's presence through the Holy Spirit, you know. It wasn't like that then. The book's honest and blunt appraisal of the human condition provides a healthy corrective to the occasionally excessive self-assurance of other wisdom writers and of today's way of thinking, I would say, because people think that. We have a justification of, of you know, God it gets to where we say everything that I have and God has blessed me and I'm, I'll seek more and get more and got all God's blessing upon me, but yet don't share it or abuse it, and we justify it, you know. In fact, we live for it. It almost becomes our God, right? Most, believe me, money is a God to a lot of people. Its radical skepticism is somewhat tempered by the resigned conclusions to rejoice in whatever gifts God may give. And that's what I'm saying. That's what it's all about, especially even for them to be thankful, right, for everything. When we pray to be thankful for God for everything He's given us, for even the air that we breathe, for every heartbeat, 
but also for the pain that brings us closer to him. You know, that's a blessing in itself. How many people have you seen that it wasn't until they become really sick that it brought them closer to God and it actually saves their lives? People that get thrown in prison, you know, it wasn't until then when they're at the lowest of their load that they could turn to God. So these are blessings. Sometimes it's people that have lived just an a unburdened life never really have a need to turn to God, and that's not good, right? A lot of people, especially even people that are called us some Christians, need that constant push. And when I look at this book here, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, when it talks about this all vanity, it kind of reminds me somewhat in the same mode of the book, book of Job. You remember the book of Job, how it was almost depressing? How, God, how can God do that? How can he let, allow the Satan to put this pure, poor man through all these trials and sicknesses and everything? But, you know, the, but it tells you what the, the bottom reward, the end reward is. That's all that really matters. That's what matters here. That's what matters in the book of Job. And that's what matters today. And we seem to forget that. In fact, we got more what I call artificial light here in the world than any time in the, in the world. In fact, we have things to draw us. Look at the kids are drawn by games and TV. They don't even go outside anymore. But we too have, 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 have changed dramatically from the time I can tell you from me, from talking, you know, when, the, uh, um, when you used to have watched TV, and you only had three channels, of course, we used to watch TV when, when a married couple wouldn't even be sleeping in the same bed. Now look at it, yeah. you know. So technology even has sort of advanced. Well, of course, we had dial phones and, the, you know, some people even before that. But now what do you have? Computer you carry in your hand, you know. And, we, and I never, never thought that I would. I had to flip up for a long time. I, would, I did not want to go to the next room. I was going to defy and technology, but in case it won me over. But uh, now, you know, he's got a small computer, but I wouldn't even text. I said, no, I'm never going to text. I've been willing, I'm being able to stay off Facebook though I will over man. <laughs> so, in the first reading here, we talk about, this begins with Kiholeth, uh, this is the words of David's son, Kiholeth, Kiholeth, King in Jerusalem says, Vanity of vanity, says Kiholeth. Vanity of vanities. All things vanity. You know? And this is basically, he says this over and over and over again. And, but he goes through a systematic manner, some weeds, and examination of life things that happen in life to explain why it is so. And this is what almost all the book is all about. So we're going to run through some of these slides, but not all of them to explain his, his view. Vanity of human toil, okay? What profit have we from all the toil which we toil under the sun? One generation departs, another generation comes, but the world forever stays. The sun rises, then the sun sets, then it presses on to the place where it rose in the beginning, right? Shifting south, then north, Back and forth shifts the wind, constantly shifting its course. All rivers flow to the sea, yet never does the sea become full. To the place where they flow, the rivers continue to flow, and night and night and night and night. You know, like, oh, whoa, whoa, me. Nothing's, what's, what is it all for? All things are wearisome, too wearisome for words. The eye is not satisfied by seeing, nor has the ear enough of hearing. What has been, that will be. What has been done, that will be done. Nothing is new under the sun. Even thing of which we say, see, this is new, has already existed in the ages that preceded us. There is no resem remembrance of past generations, no future generations to be remembered by for those who come after them. And, you know, if you just think about it, the magnitude, I mean, how far back can we remember people that had died that was very important in our life? You know, but there's even, but them, they had somebody they remembered, but it gets lost over generations and generations, you know, what I'm saying? But if you think from the beginning of time, how many people have died and how many people have accomplished so many things and won so many awards, you know, and, and everything, and you look at it, back at it, and what is it? 
you know, what is it all? You know, it's, it's come, it's what you call it our secular world. So uh, in verse 1, when we talk about this study, and then this is chapter 2 where Kehole uh, said, he says this, I said in my heart, come now, let me try you with pleasures and the enjoyment of good things. See, this too was vanity. So it, it wasn't just the normal things in life of earning to keep and doing what you had to survive and to keep going, but also looking towards joy, looking for pleasure in your life to make things, you know, to laugh and to and do such. And you say, oh, laughter, I said, mad in a mirth. What God does this to do? So it's also, you can see that, that Kihole, Kohole is kind of taking a look at life in a pessimistic view. Not optimistic, but very pessimistic view. And how many people have we met like that? They think of the negative in most things rather than the positive, right? The glass is half empty, not half full. I mass my for myself silver and gold, nothing that my eyes desired that I deny them, nor did I deprive myself of any joy, rather my heart rejoice in the fruit of all my toy. Even make myself say, I'm a happy man, in which you'll find out this is what's happening in the gospel, right? Oh, I've done it all. I'm good. I'm, I'm you know. There is no prophet under the sun. Then also, after he goes into studying the ways to life, and then for joy, then he study of wisdom and folly, being basically foolishness. I went on to the consideration of wisdom, madness, and folly, and I saw that wisdom has much profit over folly as light has over darkness. So he did see this little dis distinct difference here. Wise people have eyes in their heads, but fools walk in the darkness. But then, as you can see, therefore, I do, he said, hope it is that the wise person dies like the fool. You know, so they, if they don't have what God wants us to have, or in a way with God, we're in tune, our life's in tune with God, the wise person and the fool dies the same. You know, therefore, I detested life, since for me, the work that is done under the sun is bad for all is vanity and a chase after the wind, you know? And so that's what we talked about. And then we'll talk, this is the actual um, scripture reading, I believe, yeah, 21 through 23. For here is one who has told with wisdom and knowledge and skill, and that one's legacy must be left to another who has not told for it. You know, we talked about, you know, you save all this up for your life for when you die or you retire, and then all of a sudden you die, and then it's going to go to somebody else, either your loved one, your, your, uh, your spouse, or even your kids, who somebody say may not have worked for it or deserve it or whatever, but it doesn't certainly go with you, right? Can't take it with you. See, this is also vanity and a great evil. For what profit comes to mortals from all the toe and anxiety of earth with which the toe under the sun? Every day sorrow and grief are their occupation. Even at night their hearts are not at rest. This is also vanity. It almost talks about daily, day-to-day -day anxiety, worrying about what we're going to eat, what we're going to do, you know, worrying about a job, worrying about this and that. I can tell you that I went to Gatorland yes, last night with, I mean, uh, yesterday with my grandkids, and the night before, I, I kept thinking, man, it's going to be hot, it's going to be sun blazing, I'm going to have a big sombrero over my hat. I was thinking, maybe I should wear a long sleeve shirt, and I, kept, I, I, I really couldn't hardly sleep because I kept thinking about it, and I know I'll bring a big umbrella also in case, you know. You know and I had all this in my mind, so when I got up and got ready to go, I got my hat on got this umbrella and everything, and I looked outside and it was as cloudy as it could be. <laughs> I mean, it was cloudy and, and sun, and, and finally we went there and I met my grandson there and it was real cool and, cl and cloudy and it kind of sprinkled a little bit, you know? And the whole time we were there, I didn't even have to wear a hat. And lucky I left my umbrella in the car. But you know, I wore all that for nothing. That was in vain for sure. Uh, <coughs> 
So there is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and provide themselves with good things from Brother Toad. Even this I saw is from the hand of God. He gives and provides, right? We worry too much. For who can eat or drink apart from God? And this is important, but what he's saying here. For to one who pleases God, he gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the one who displeases God, God gives the task of gathering possessions for the one who pleases God. So God, it's almost like God rewards the ones that pleases him with those, the ones that don't displease him's work, basically. This is also vanity and a chase after wind. He's talking about the people who do not please God. So the author, Kiholeth, assumes the role of Solomon, who as king would have had wealth and resources at his disposal to acquire wisdom and knowledge and pleasurable pursuits. In particular, the abundant wealth and physical gratifications describe the extravagance of Solomon's reign, guided by wisdom and using all the means money can buy. Kaholi sets out on a deliberate search to discover if pleasure constitutes true happiness. He had many women and concubines which made up his huge harem. So he had all that time, money, to look into all this. But Kohelet is not advocating unrestrained indulgence. Rather, he counsels the acceptance of the good things God chooses to give, to be appreciative of that. You know, this is the first of seven similar conclusions he does in the book of Ecclesiastes. Of course, we won't go through the other ones. According to Kohelet, God does not make an objective, eventual, uh, evidential. Oh, what do you say? Evidential moral distinction between saint and sinner, God gives as God pleases. And that's what I was talking about here. He has this pessimistic rather than optimistic view, and you can understand how he thought that way back then. You know what I mean? We, we, it'd be almost sinful to think the same way today, you know? And so that's what we have to remember when we read this. Any questions on the first reading? Any comments on the first reading? All right, the second reading is a letter from St. Paul, and I'm just going to say I'm going to go through this. This is basically the introduction to Colossians, where St. Paul came to the Colossians, and why what he talked to them. I think what's important here is that uh, uh, the, it's, uh, let's see here, for help in dealing with these problem, or less problems they were having there. Paul taught that, uh, see, their teaching stress angels, principalities, and powers, and we're talking about the teachers that were teaching here in this city, Colossae, uh, Colossae, and uh, which were connected with astrological powers and cultic practices and rules about food and drink and spiritual disciplines. These teachings, Paul insists, distract from the person and work of Christ for salvation. Paul taught that such teachings are about shadows. Christ is the reality. So he went there to straighten them out. They were throwing a lot of stuff into this baggage of Christianity. And he says, hold on, hold on. And that's even like, for instance, when we talk about the law, the Ten Commandments, the Jewish people, <coughs> added 600 more rules attached to these 10. And, you know, just overburdened the, the, the common uh, people. For help in dealing with these problems that the new teacher proposed, they call it the wisdom of Paul was sought out, but was in prison at a place where that letter does not mention. Paul, without in entering into debate over the existence of angelic spirits or their function, simply affirms that Christ possesses the sum total of redemptive power and the spiritual renewal of human person occurs through contact and baptism with the person of Christ who died and rose again. And this is very important. It's very important. It's, it's always like to say that God, it almost seems like God knew, knew what he was doing. I mean, you know, to send his son for one thing, but to make him human is another thing, but to have him to live a you know, normal life and upbring him since he was a, a little child, right, and live among us and grow as we do, but, but also to suffer, and not, not only suffer, but to die 
Well, and more, more importantly, not just to die, but to be resurrected, to rise up again. You know what I mean? Almost any one of them, we could have probably stopped. But not only to suffer, die, and resurrect, but to ascend into heaven, to sit at the right hand of God, and once again restore humanity with divinity. That is the most beautiful story you can have. It's a great love story, to tell you the truth. It's God's love for us that he did all that, or that he would allow that to even happen. His own son to suffer in that way. And so this is what's important, and that's why he is important. And Paul was trying to say. And here is the uh, second reading. It says, uh, mystical death and resurrection. If then you were raised with Christ, seek what is above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Think of what is above, not what is, what is on earth. For you have died in your life hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, your life appears, then you too will appear with him in glory. And I'm adding here the, I hate, I, I, I'm not going to use the word hate, but I, I just dislike whenever they split these scriptures in there, I believe, you know, that to me, are sometimes key to what's going to be the next scripture that's in the, the reading. <coughs> and it continues on the renunciation of vice. So he says it's not only to follow Jesus and what he says, but just like what even John the Baptist said is what? Repent. And that's re renunciate vice, sin, right? Put to death then the parts of you that are earthly, you know, he cries right off the bat, of the earth, earthly. And we are burdened with that, just from our natural tendency to, to live life the way that life is lived on earth. Immortality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and the greed that is idolatry. The greed, and our greed could be for many things. It may be in thought, word, or deed. Not just material things, but in thought, word, and in deed, you know? So those things we can be addicted to, and we can be, uh, it could be idolatry in our lives. Because of, these because of these, the wrath of God is coming upon the disobedient. By these, you too once conducted yourself when you lived in that way. So it said you should have converted when you say you claim to be Christian or you're baptized, you went through the sacraments, it should change your life. But now you must put them all away, anger, fury, malice, slander, and obscene language out of your mouth. So it starts in nine again, and that was the in-between that we just did. Stop lying to one another since you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed for knowledge in the image of its creator. All God's plan, right? Here there is not Greek and Jew circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. And the Scythian is a, barbar a barbarous people from the north of the Black Sea. So... By retaining the message of the gospel that the risen, living Christ is the source of the salvation of our salvation, the Colossians will be free from false religions, evaluations of the things of the world. And we all shall be, right? They have died to these, but one day when Christ appears, they will live with Christ in the presence of God. Life after earth, death is eternal with our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is all that matters. This scripture is not just for the Colossians, it is for who? Us. It's saying the same thing to us because it, nothing really has changed. If anything, we were saying that, you know, some people say that there's no more water in the world than it has been since God created the world. It's just that's transformed to, you know, the sky and, and different f forms of the three natures uh, matter. And so same thing where we talk about evil. There's no more evil than it was been since Adam and Eve. It's just that more people are participating in that evil. So it's, it, 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 that's what's happening. 
is that, you know, it, that, and you know that it's true. There's less people going to church, more people belonging to the world, and that's the problem. Uh, and I want to say that this is supported when we talk about the second reading. We go to Mark. It says, whoever wishes to come after me, after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and that of the gospel will save it. And this is what's important, especially as we're living in this world today. What profit is there for one to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? What could one give in exchange for his life? We're talking about eternal life, right? Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words and this faithless, faithless and sinful generation the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And that is very scary. At least it is to me. Because, you know, anyway, it's a scary time. But God loves us so that even up to our death, we can repent and change. So... I'm not going to go over these uh, catechisms here because I want to go into the gospel, but if you look in the catechism, it has, tells a lot about the scripture readings in a second. There's 655, you know, two, a lot of them you can see there. If you look at your catechism, you can look up the scripture and it points you straight to the uh, um, paragraphs in the catechism. As you can see, there's many of them. So we're going to go through them, and we're going to go here to the gospel. Any questions on second reading? Comments? So you can see how it kind of ties in to uh, the first and the second, but even so, the gospel. And I'm not going to go through here because this just tells us about Luke and the gospel and, and what he did here. So we're going to go straight into the gospel here in chapter 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. He replied to him, Friend, who appointed me as your judge and arbitrator? Then he said to the crowd, Take care to guard against all greed. For though one may be rich, one's life does not consist of possessions. You know what I mean? It's all vanity, really. That's what it's, you know, it's, saying, it's saying. And the same thing when Paul was talking to him, Hey, this stuff here is not that important. What's important is Jesus. Parable of the rich fool. Then he told them a parable. There was a rich man whose land produced a bountiful harvest. He asked himself, what should I do? For I do not have space to store my harvest. And he said to them, this is what I shall do. I shall tear down my barns and build larger ones. There I shall store all my grain and other goods. <coughs> Excuse me. And I shall say to myself, as for you, you have so many good things stored up for many years. Rest, eat, drink, and be merry. This is almost opposite of the pessimistic K. Hoyt right? And so he's more optimistic about what he's doing in his own life and justifying it. And I can, you can probably hear him say, oh, God has blessed me abundantly, so I'm going to dwell at it. He, I, he's given me heaven on earth, you know what I mean? But God said to him, uh huh, you fool. This night your life will be demanded of you and the things that you have prepared to whom will they belong. And just like when Kiholi, Kihol, Kihile, I get that wrong, they were saying, what happens to all this stuff we tow under the sun? Who gets it after we're gone, right? Thus it will be for the one who stores up treasure for himself, but is not rich in what matters to God. God, man, he, he, I'm telling you, he knows what he's doing here. Well, I have the question, what does that mean? Rich in what matters to God. What does that make, mean to you? Anybody? Go ahead. I 
I mean, I mean, there's really no wrong answer to say. It could be even a personal answer as we answer it personally, though. But, you know, if you look at it, what rich it matters to God is basically that God's love for us, right, is all that really matters. Without his love for us, we'd be cockroaches, you know, step on us and die, and that's it. But what I'm saying is that because of God's love, he sent what? Sent who? So the best way we can show our love for God is to do what? Love Jesus and do as he asks. You want to say something? Go ahead. I, I find it somewhat fascinating that this gospel appears on the same weekend when an individual just won $1.4 billion. Uh, it just, <laughs> uh, it is kind of an interesting uh, 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 coincidence. Yeah, but Jim, you know, if, if I'd have been me, I would have shared it with you. So don't worry about it. I'm sure anybody in the church would have shared it with everybody. I think one thing about what matters to God, I think if we look at the nativity story, we can see what matters to God. We know what doesn't matter to God. Material things don't matter to God because he put his son in a manger. Material things don't matter to God because the first people who to whom the birth was announced were not rich people, but poor shepherds. So we know that that doesn't matter. And so what matters to God, as, uh, as we said, is, is love and restoring his kingdom to earth. And understanding that his kingdom doesn't come with all these, all these superficial things. Mm. Yeah, and, and as, you, as Mahatma Gandhi being one of my idols when I grew up, I grew up with this thinking of the, that it doesn't really matter what we do. What matters is why we do it. And the why must be for the praise, honor, and glory of God. That is the only way. So it's not what we do, it's our intent of why we do things. And we have to, as long as we do it with the love of God, it is it's great, a great thing, right? So, anyway, it goes on to tell you here in this gospel about how not to uh, be contrary to what God wants and to live in a secular life in the world and everything. And it goes on in this verses which I, after the gospel, which I encourage you to read, I don't do anything. But here it says, look as joined together sayings, contrasting those who focus and trust in life as own material successions, symbolized here by the rich fool of the parable. So he's using the rich fool as for us, basically, examples. That, and I say us, even, even as holy as we may be, there are times when we slip, right? So, and here again, this more Catholic, Catholic, uh, uh, catechism of the Catholic Church, you can look up here on the same thing with the verses, which I love to do here. And so, um, and one thing I wanted to to also emphasize is that when Jesus did miracles on earth, it was so that they may believe. People always ask that question, well, how come there are not miracles on earth now like there was when Jesus was come? And it was because there was a reason and intent for him to have these miracles, and that is so they may believe. And I used the, the miracle when he raised Lazarus, as much as that was his friend and he loved him, his sister sent a certain thing, he didn't raise Lazarus because of his love for them. He raised it and said, so that they may believe that you sent me. For all, and he's talking about two of the living, right? All right. Any questions on the gospel? Any comments? Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we adore, worship, and love you. We give you thanks for all you have given us. We ask forgiveness for all our sins. We pray for an end to the insanity of evil and for all those that suffer and die because of it. Lord, give the world your love, forgiveness, and peace. We ask that you grant us the things we humbly ask for and need. We know that you can. We pray that you will. Thy will be done. Amen. Amen. And Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Have a blessed week.